all the things you know people traditionally ascribed to the the Reformation, I mean, the beginnings of capitalism and the the decline of magic and the uh, inspiration for the scientific revolution and the nation state. It's all nonsense. There's absolutely no connection between the Reformation and, and any of that. Alas, you know, as a Catholic, I have to admit that capitalism is just as much a Catholic vice as it is a Protestant vice. It's a human vice, and you you find it in 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 a lot of very different cultural context there's nothing particularly in Protestantism that predisposes people to be capitalists and there's no deficiency in Catholicism which prevents people from being capitalists. Same is true of the scientific revolution. I mean actually you know most of the great scientific initiatives in uh, early modern Europe were created, launched in the minds of people who were Catholics or who were indifferent to religions. Protestants weren't disproportionately represented amongst um, scientists by by any means uh, a nation state I mean that's again a you know basically in these well there weren't really any nation states in any modern Europe anyway but the the autonomous sovereignty of the the states again a long-standing development has been going on for a long time and owed everything to political culture and very little to to religious culture and the, I see the Reformation as part of a much bigger phenomenon. I mean, I think if you look at the world of the late Middle Ages and the 16th century, it's not so much divided between the Catholic and the Protestant, it's divided between the worldly and the godly. And the, basically the reformers, whether they were Protestant reformers or Catholic reformers, or indeed Orthodox reformers, were really all on the same side. They were contending with a a world that frustrated them because of its lack of godliness. They were contending, you know, with rural populations who are under evangelized and riven with what we now call popular culture, but which they call superstition. And they were striving to communicate a more dogmatic awareness of Christianity to their inert and unsatisfactory and worldly fellow Christians. That's a really big story. About religion in the early modern West and our, our distraction by really sort of rather petty divisions between Protestants and, and Catholics has prevented us from seeing that. Well, one of the other events that you write about in 1492 was the expulsion of the Jews from Spain. You write about that as, in a way, enabling the golden age of Spain. Can you say what the, what the, what the connections were there? Yes, I mean, obviously, one of the reasons for writing about the expulsion of the the Jews is that it gives me an opportunity to do what I wanted to do technically with the book, which was write a, a kind of travelogue, a book about what it would be like to accompany the travellers of 1492. You weren't just Columbus. <laughs> There's also stuff in the book about, you know, a Korean shipwreck victim in in China, an Italian merchant who crosses the Indian Ocean, and, um, and an Arabic or, 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 or Muslim expulsee from Granada who crosses the Sahara. There, there, there are lots of these travel stories going on. And amongst the most poignant and intriguing are those of Jews who are expelled from Spain and who traverse the Mediterranean, just, you know, seeking somewhere to lay their their heads. And you've got the sort of great story of um, Judah ibn Hayat, who, who you know, he's expelled from, from um, uh, Spain. He's imprisoned in Tlemcen. He's plague struck in Naples. You know, everything happens. It's a story of Job. I mean, he even likens himself to Job, and he ends up at peace in the Jewish community in um, Mantua. So there is a sort of um, you know, appeal as a narrative device embedded in the story of the expulsion of the Jews, which greatly appeals to me. But, uh, you know, because I'm Spanish, I can't help make a point about the expulsion of the Jews, which is specific, uh, uh, specifically relevant to the history of of Spain, it's usually said that the expulsion of the Jews wasn't only a crime, it was a mistake. You know, the, the state deprived itself of their wealth-creating talents, of their taxes, of the great intellectual input which they'd made to Spain. But what these views 
fail to take into account is that, of course, most Jews stayed in Spain. It was only the minority who refused to accept conversion to Christianity who were expelled. So the total effect of this event wasn't so much to expel the Jews as to appropriate them and integrate them into the mainstream of Spanish life, to reclassify them as Catholics and enable them to become full participants in Spanish society in a way in which by their own choice they hadn't formerly been. Obviously, you know, like every religious minority, they cultivated their own identity to some extent, inhabited their own ghettos and so on. So you've got this great expansion of the world of Spanish achievement and intellectual endeavor as a result of the incorporation of all these these um, Jews into it who you know, I mean, it's just a fact of history that Jews are disproportionately represented amongst people of talent in almost every society in which you find them. And I suggest in the book that perhaps without this great infusion of Jewish brilliance into the Spanish mainstream, you wouldn't have had the golden age of, of Spain. You wouldn't have had the the era of unprecedented and unparalleled and alas ever since unrepeated <laughs> you know, flourishing of the the arts and and um letters and just the magnitude of the importance and impact of spain on the world that was true of the 16th and 17th um centuries and you know i do think the facts bear this out because it, you know, it's very common finding amongst uh, students of Spanish art and literature in that period that a disproportionate number of the great achievements achievers were of Jewish parentage or ancestry. Now, Felipe, I wanted to ask you about wind, because you say at one point that you think historians, I'm paraphrasing, but historians are very good at producing hot air, but they're not paying enough attention to wind. And I certainly, for one, hadn't realised just how important prevailing winds are in the whole history of of exploration and, and navigation, and and navigation is so important to the themes of this book I, that I, that I'm going to ask you to say a little bit more about wind. I'm not an environmental determinist, but it's it, it's just you know an inescapable fact that for the age of for the whole of the age of sail, which is pretty much the whole of human history, wind is the biggest single influence on where you can go and how fast you can get there, and. One of the things that makes 1492 a world-transforming year is that that's the year that Columbus discovered, not America, he didn't discover America, as everybody is always pointing out, you know, people had known about it, there were lots of people there. Uh, it wasn't um, that big a deal uh, anyway, because of course when he got there he was terribly disappointed with how poor it was. But what he really did discover, was the way the wind system of the Atlantic worked. He decoded this wind system. And the wind system of the Atlantic is of such a nature that it leads the navigator on to the wind systems of the rest of the world. Once you find your way across the Atlantic, you, you find the the westerners of the South Atlantic, which, which carry you around the whole globe. That was a very great privilege for Europeans and European explorers. Uh, this is the cause, it's the highway that leads them to the rest of the world and opens up the possibility of world-encompassing trade and imperialism, which becomes the means by which they establish eventually, over a long period of time, at a cost of terrible you know, bloodshed and misery, establish kind of world hegemony. Uh, only the the winds made that possible, and really only Europeans were in a position to exploit their full potential. Uh, other great civilizations, the Chinese, the Ottomans, they, they were all in, in various ways cut off from access to the wind system of the of the world. So that that's why Columbus's voyage is, is really of world-changing significance. Everybody focuses on America, but it's all, America's almost, you know, sort of a minor part of a much bigger story. Felipe Fernandez Ernesto. 1492, the year a world began, is at now in hardback. You'll find full details on ordering the book at blackwell.co.uk.